we are moving on to our last speaker for our afternoon session. Uh, our last speaker is Primavera de Filippi. Primavera is a legal scholar at Harvard University, as well as an internet activist and artist, exploring the intersection between law and the technology. Her speech title is Generate, uh, Generative Autom Autonomous Art what implications for copyright law. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Primavera. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm an artist and I'm a, a researcher at the same time. Um, and my research is mostly looking at uh, uh, the legal implications of uh, digital technology and their implication on copyright and on regulation more generally. Uh, I've been focusing a lot on the question of um, uh, digital art and creative commons and uh, and all like digital right management system related to to online piracy. And then I moved on into um, looking at the legal aspect of blockchain technologies and um, and and also the implications of blockchain technology on copyright. And um, most of my artistic practice is also designed around uh, using art in order to illustrate my research, uh, but also creating objects uh, that can further the research, objects that I can analyze in order than to advance um, the research by, by looking at the implications, uh, especially the legal implication that they raise. Um, so with regard to this presentation, I want to focus specifically on the question of uh, generative uh, and autonomous, where generative is the art that is created mostly by AI, uh, whereas autonomous is more like the art that is created by blockchain technology. Um, and what are the implications that uh, uh, technology have on uh, the basic uh, uh, fundamental bricks of uh, copyright law. And so the, the basic question that I want to address with this talk is uh, whether art uh, does still uh, need the artist and the still is in parentheses because of course the question is uh, to which extent are those digital technology really changing something or was where are they just exacerbating um, some artistic practices that existed already in the past and making them more popular and more visible. Um, so we can see just like a very short snapshot of uh, uh, the interaction uh, between artistic creation, artistic consumption and copyright. Um, so we have the artist that creates the artwork and then we have the audience that experience the artwork and the artwork becomes this means of uh, indirect communication between the artist and the audience. And, uh, and then copyright um, recognize some, some, some aspect of this uh, interaction. Uh, and, and some of those components are the basic, uh, um, the basic building block and the fundamental pillars of copyright. So one is the notion of authorship. Uh, so there needs to be a particular author, which is of course the holder of the copyright. Um, and then there is the question of creation, which require originality, which require um, non, non, non copying and so forth. So the process of ideation, production, there needs to be some work being put into the, the act, act of creation. Um, and then there is the artwork, which requires some kind of fixation, uh, which whether it's like physical instantiation or fixation in the mind of the people seeing it, but the artwork needs to somehow be recognizable as a finite expression, which is recognizable as the, as the element that is subject to copyright. And so technology initially has been very friendly to copyright. In fact, uh, it has uh, generated uh, the, the justification, the underlying justification for creating copyright, uh, mostly through the printing press, um, because all of a sudden it was very easy to reproduce uh, at least literary works. Uh, and there was a need of creating an incentive for publisher to make the investment in actually building this printing uh, uh, 
um, endeavors. And of course, being able to prevent author from just doing co copying the work, right? So that the copyright was like an incentivization mostly for the publisher initially, and then the more romantic vision of uh, uh, the author as being this uh, um, genius creator. Uh, and so the copyright eventually shifted away from being held by the publisher and has been assigned uh, to the author first and foremost, with the possibility of then licensing the, the copyright. And, um, and then comes, of course, like the, the age of mechanical reproduction, in which it's not just the printing press, but everything all of a sudden becomes uh, very easily reproducible. And, uh, and especially with uh, the advent of the internet and digital technology, then uh, we have seen quite some uh, uh, concern around the possibility of actually enforcing uh, copyright because it becomes extremely easy to reproduce, distribute, modify, and create derivative works. Uh, and then more recently with uh, artificial intelligence, we see that it's not just the patrimonial rights of uh, copyright that are put into question, but also the moral rights. So the question of like, who actually is the author? What is the, um, the integrity, the paternity uh, of, of those works of art? And so I'm going to go through the three pillars of copyright and see how different technologies for the time as are actually questioning those, uh, those basic premises. So first of all is the author. Uh, so the internet has enabled uh, this new form of uh, human collaboration through technology in which it is now possible to make pieces of art that are created by hundreds and thousands of people. And so it becomes extremely difficult to, to qualify uh, and who exactly is the author, who has contributed, what is it like joint authorship of co-authorship, and how is the patrimonial rights of copyright to be redistributed, and how does it work in the terms of moral rights, in the sense that if you have a, um, sorry, if you have, um, if, you have, if you have like one person that will refuse, for instance, the uh, exploitation of uh, this uh, of this whole artwork, then they might potentially prevent everyone else from doing anything with that. Uh, so I, I also created in 2007 an experiment in order to illustrate my research on copyright, um, which was this white canvas in which anyone could go and add something or erase something. Um, and of course, all those uh, artwork were under uh, uh, Creative Commons license. Uh, attribution so basically it was like an invitation to show that because of this new technology if we don't actually use those licenses it becomes extremely difficult to exploit uh, those works it, it becomes impossible to display any of those uh, very long chains of art or that have been created over time because anyone could just prevent the, the exploitation of everyone and so all of a sudden on the internet because of these new opportunities for collaboration, then copyright become almost an obstacle for artists willing to collaborate and disseminate their work. Um, and then we have like other type of uh, technology which question the author. Uh, so in the 19th century, we have the advent of the art monographs, uh, which at the, at the time was, was seen as like a very uh, questionable problematic technology because there was this question about uh, is technology actually going to replace artists if we can actually have this, this mechanical device that can actually make piece of art? Are they going to develop at some point to, to completely replace uh, human creativity and human creation? So already back in the 19th century, uh, we were actually working on, the, on those questions. And again, those are, uh, those are interesting questions because, because it's created by a machine the outcome of uh, the, the, the produced output uh, does not really have an author, right? It's, it's the machine is the author and therefore um, it's question about, uh, about who should actually hold the copyright in this. Is it the person that created the machine uh, or simply will there be no, no copyright at all? Um, singly, uh, as also uh, done in this direction with the uh, machine generated artworks. And again, the same question, uh, while Tingeli is, of course, the author of the machine, which is generating the, the intimate uh, uh, painting or drawing, uh, who actually holds the copyright in that drawing. Um, and then we have like a, a different uh, new form of collaboration, which are no longer just humans 
and humans or humans and machine, but actually uh, humans and animal or living beings. Um, and so especially like like uh, bio, uh, bio art, uh, uh, where artists are setting up a particular schema and then things grow on their own. And so the artist does not fully control the way in which things will evolve, but they just control the plane in which things are happening. So we have Andy Carroll um, and then Thomas Aracino with the spider web. Uh, and then more, uh, more, uh, more question about it with regard to copyright uh, is when it's not really a collaboration, when, but it's when it's an actual animal that is creating the work. And so we have the, uh, the, the famous example of uh, Boronalis and like paintings that are done for a donkey. Um, and more recently, the, the monkey selfie, which generated a lot of question around copyright, whether a monkey could actually hold, could be the author of a particular picture, whether he could own copyright because it made a, a particular selfie. And it created a lot of debates about whether perhaps it was actually the photograph that set up the machine so that the selfie could press uh, uh, the button that should actually own the copyright in, in this picture, whether it was the monkey itself that should own the copyright or whether simply there should be no copyright. And eventually the decision is there is no copyright because animals cannot be artists. They cannot be the author and copyright doesn't recognize authorship um, in that. And then we have, of course, uh, art created by computers, uh, whether that is traditional generative art in which someone creates a particular software in order to make, uh, to create a particular output or with like machine learning and uh, uh, AI generated artworks in which you just feed a lot of data and then the artwork will create something new. And then again, like the question has in terms of copyright, who, who is the copyright holder of this? Or is there any copyright at all? Uh, should, should we held that the person that are producing the software are the author and perhaps in the context of generative art where the, the author is really uh, thinking very carefully and programming the code in order to generate a particular outcome, it might, it might make sense even though copyright probably wouldn't recognize this as potentially being uh, the author because the, the, the creative output was not predictable by the, by the initial conceptor. And then in the case of uh, machine learning, it's even more questionable because uh, there is like the developer that is just creating a generic, uh, general purpose machine learning uh, software GAN and so forth. And then people just selecting picture and it's just the act of selecting picture about how we're gonna feed uh, the, the, the machine learning system actually enough in order to justify that this is the author of the outcome and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of question around like, how do we protect the outcome of our AI generated work? Um, and so this is all like uh, uh, the core, one of the core questions of my research with regard to uh, technology and machine generated artworks in which uh, increasingly because of AI and machine learning, there is like this, uh, this, this need of trying to understand how uh, existing copyright law could actually protect those work. Uh, it was discussed rightly a little bit before whether can we actually identify a particular copyright in the, in the, in the as a sui generis type in the database? Can we actually consider that the neural net is a database? Um, is the person collecting the data and feeding it? Or perhaps is the person choosing, selecting the outcome out of like all the possible uh, image in the latent space? Is the person that is finding the right ones to be held to be the author? Uh, so there's a lot of questions around this and in general uh, copyright law, um, especially like in, in civil law country does not uh, recognize any type of uh, protection. Uh, for anything that is uh, computer generated or machine generated. And then there's this distinction between machine generated versus uh, computer assisted. And so again, the question becomes when I'm, when I'm using a machine in order to create an artwork, whether it's like an AI machine learning or whether it's like a mechanical device, am, am I, I am the author that is being assisted by those tools or is the work actually being generated? And if I am assisted by the tool, then I am the author. But if 
the, 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 the tool is actually generating the actor, then there is no copyright, at least in civil law. And some common law countries just recognize a very limited and short term copyright to the creator of the device. Uh, and then secondly, there is like the question around the process of creation. Uh, so which combine the question of like the inspiration, uh, the actual production, and then the question of originality. Does it originate from the author or does it originate from the outside? Um, and so again, we have like increasingly uh, technologies enabling new form of uh, art, which actually do not originate only from the author, but originate from the author and the public, for instance. And so we have like interactive art that require some kind of action from, from the audience in order to experience. Um, we have like hyper interactive art in which the, the, the author is doing almost nothing, just setting up pain, and then everything comes from the outside. And so again, who, who who, who is actually producing this after? Is it the person that set up the frame or is it uh, the audience that is creating the noise in the case of uh, John Cage? Uh, we have hyperactive art. Uh, so the example of Marina Abramovich in which the author becomes almost a subject or a canvas on which the audience is actually being the artist that is creating um, that is creating the performance and creating therefore the artwork while the, the artist is just staying still. Um, and then we have all the question of course of ready-made uh, where just take something, sign it and all of a sudden it has become art. Uh, and, and then then where uh, there is really this claim that the art, the, the, the process of artistic creation is, is not the, the output, is not the production, is actually just the act of signing and the signature itself is basically the, 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 the product of the art. Um, and then we have like those, uh, those artists which uh, actually create those uh, type of processes of instruction based. Uh, so Solerit is probably the, the best example in which um, the artist is actually creating a set of instructions, creating a protocol, and then is giving it to anyone in the world in order to instantiate those artists uh, within, the, within the, the realm of those instructions. And so as, as time goes, more and more people become co-artists in the sense that they actually are instantiating, they're producing, the production of the artwork is made by other people, but they are doing it according to the instruction of the original artist that has elaborated that particular process or protocol. Um, and this is something that I have been exploring a lot with my own work with Diplantoids, which is uh, this uh, type of um, blockchain-based uh, life form. Uh, so basically mechanical sculpture, which uh, can be fed with uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, as they collect enough cryptocurrency to reproduce themselves, then uh, they, they open an op a, a call for proposition and uh, any artist, designer, anyone can actually submit a proposition about how they envision to create the next, uh, uh, the next plant art. And uh, um, after a particular uh, structure of voting, then the plantoid will, will hire uh, this artist that has been selected in order to create a new copy of itself. And so the idea here is really to almost try to eliminate to the maximum possible uh, the figure of the artist, which the original artist, which would be me, uh, within the process of creation, because I just need to create the first plantoids. And then there is a protocol about how those plantoids can reproduce themselves. And I don't even touch the money that they receive, like the, the whole process of funding and production and reproduction is done directly through this protocol. And yet, even though those, those plantoids are reproducing themselves and other artists are responsible for the physical instantiation of those, of those, of those new plantoids, and yet I am still recognized as the artist uh, because I am the artist of the conceiving framework and protocol, which is called the plantoid. And so in some way it shows how, um, of course, my, my goal is to have as many plantoids in the world. 
And of course, I cannot do all of this work myself. And so all of a sudden, by providing these protocols and these instructions, it becomes possible for other people to support uh, my process of artistic creation by actually becoming artists themselves and creating their own pieces of art, uh, which are recognized as the artist. And yet I am also recognized as the overarching artist of the protocol that is instantiating those plantains. Um, and, and in the same thing, uh, and then in the, in the case of uh, AI, uh, we have this uh, very important question of inspiration, um, meaning that as we, as we feed uh, prior data, uh, initial images and, and content into a machine learning uh, system, then uh, uh, everything that is generated by the AI is based on the prior art. The, like the AI only operates by pure inspiration from the past. Um, then of course you can create something new, but then the question is like, where does this something new come? Uh, how does the latent space of possibility emerge if not always by replicating uh, or, or tweaking something from the, from the, from the past. And, and the question is, again, is it any different from how artists operate generally? It's not the inspiration that we have as individuals um, always based on everything we've been experiencing in the past. Um, and so well, can we actually claim that an AI is not as creative as us because it doesn't really have this exterior inspiration or interior inspiration uh, because everything comes from the data set that it has been fed to. Um, and of course, when the data set becomes sufficiently large and it becomes impossible to even recognize what is coming out as being like potentially infringing on the work that has been fed into it, then of course, uh, potentially we can say that actually there is an inspiration that is happening and, uh, and it's not that different from uh, traditional human artist. And then finally, to conclude, there is the question of the artwork itself. So what qualifies the artwork under copyright is uh, where does the creative endeavor of the author lies? Right? Does it lie in the process? Does it lie in the outcome or where else? Um, and so again, so in the case of John Cage, the artwork is actually the idea. The, the, the art of having a silent song where the song emerged from the noise from the, from the outside. It is, a, it is mostly an idea. That's what the genius, the, the creativity is about this idea as opposed to the actual instantiation and implementation. Uh, same thing with Boronelli. Uh, the, the, the art of is the performance, is the conceptualization of doing something via a donkey as opposed to the actual outcome that the donkey has created. Um, and in the case of AI, uh, where is this uh, creative endeavor? Well, it's not necessarily in the outcome because the outcome doesn't, doesn't, doesn't require any creativity. The, 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 the creative endeavor is in the algorithm, is in the process that is being used in order to lead to the creation of, uh, of those particular outcomes. And so, just to conclude, I want to actually raise this, uh, this, this question, which is, um, are we actually entering a space in which uh, there, is, there is this new type of uh, art, which we can define as art as protocol, right? And the, the, there is a new, a new category. It's not performance, it's not, it's not the process. It's, it's really like, it's the, it's the conceptualization of a particular protocol, of a particular algorithm, which is, something that is capable of generating a lot of expressions, but those expressions do not necessarily, uh, are not directly correlated with the geniality of the, of the author and the artist, the original idea, uh, which should be held, uh, which should be copyright protected, is actually the protocol that has been used for the generation of those artworks. And, um, and this is interesting because when we actually look at um, protocol as the ultimate artwork that should be protected, uh, copyright actually cannot protect those type of artworks because as a conceptualization, it doesn't have a fixation. And so all you can protect under copyright law is the instances that are coming out of this protocol, as opposed to the protocol itself, which remains also as this 
latent meta idea that needs to be deployed into a particular uh, artwork. And, but also like is this type of, uh, of, of artwork protocolist is also interesting because perhaps it doesn't actually want, it doesn't need protection from copyright, but to the contrary, uh, because protecting the protocol through copyright will mean that it, it becomes impossible for other people to actually instantiate this work and the and the the the, the concept of the protocol protocolism is that the more people are actually instantiating the protocol, the more work the artist is actually producing, even though the artist is not producing them itself. And, and whether this is produced by uh, an AI, whether it's produced by a machine, or if it is produced by other individuals, it's still part of the same schema in which I create my algorithm, I create my protocol, and then I run it. I, 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 let, it, I let other things or other people or other animals potentially execute it. Uh, and so, of course, like we have example of uh, uh, from the past, for instance, like Pollock, we could say that this is some kind of early protocolist in which, like, by by conceiving a particular process of creation, all of a sudden, if anyone that all of a sudden were to use the same technique to create a particular piece of art, would be recognized as actually doing Pollock, right? Because the the, the artist has so enshrined uh, its own identity and personality into that process, into that protocol, that anyone using the protocol is helping Pollock create more work. Uh, same thing with the Ulipo. Um, so by creating this particular set of rules and constraints, then anyone can actually feed into this large body of work that is, uh, uh, that is part of the same uh, collective. Um, and so um, the idea here is like, uh, is uh, protocolism um, perhaps a new artistic movement? Uh, because mostly because of AI, because of generative art and like all those things that technology and the ability of creating digital algorithms and using machines in order to instantiate a lot of works based on this protocol. Uh, but as we have seen, this is not new to AI. This is not something that didn't exist before, but of course, AI has made it so popular that now it's very visible that there is this new type of artistic creation that needs to be recognized as something. And then we need to understand where is actually the art of creation in this field. Um, and my, 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 my hypothesis here is that perhaps we do, we are, we are already exploring for a few years, we are experimenting this new type of, of artistic practice, which could qualify as an artistic movement. And yet, because it has not been named yet, a lot of artists that might be qualified as protocolists uh, do not necessarily recognize themselves as such because by the lack of naming this uh, new artistic movement, um, which is an artistic movement that is by its, by its intrinsic definition uh, antithetic to copyright because copyright is all about preventing reproduction, whereas in the context of protocolism, production is actually reproduction of the work and actually the goal is to maximize uh, the reproduction in order to maximize the capacity of the protocolist author to maximize um, the, the creation. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. I, I, I have, I'm happy to discuss uh, five minutes or more perhaps in the panel about NFTs. I have a few slides, but I know that uh, my time is over. Uh, so maybe I leave it uh, to the questions or to the debate. Okay, so <clears throat> could you tell us your opinion about uh, NFT art? Because uh, I remember we discussed the possibility that you were talking about this topic. So I would like to hear your opinion. By the way, it's a hot topic here in China. Yes, uh, I'm going to share again my screen then because I have put out something. Um, yeah, so my opinion, I can, I can give you my opinion as a, uh, as a copyright lawyer <laughs> um, because I think that's actually very interesting. So, I mean, 
NFTs, uh, I'm sure uh, I don't need to talk too much about it. I think people are mostly aware about it. But there is some very interesting things that are happening with regard to, to copyright. Um, and so I, um, I don't know if you, so first of all, the first question that is interesting is uh, when we talk about NFT, we're, we're really talking about digital scarcity, uh, which is amazing in the sense that we are enabling for the first time digital artists to actually create uh, unique and scarce copies of a particular artwork. And so in the same way as we had, um, you know, um, photographs that can create limited edition on their prints, uh, all of a sudden now digital artists can do the same and they can create unique or limited edition of their, uh, of their artworks. Now, the question is that um, uh, somehow, when we talk about the NFT, the technology, of course, is like it's not really preventing anyone. Just like just like prints, limited edition in the context of prints, I could I could create like a limited edition of like 100 prints for a particular photograph, but no one is preventing me from doing the same again, right? And there is no certification. The blockchain does not enable to certify any more than than just the the the, the trust in the in the author that the same, the same artist is not publishing the same digital image as a different NFT. And all of a sudden, theoretically, there is digital scarcity, but actually there can be multiple copies of the same NFTs that exist at the same time, right? And so to some extent, we need to trust the, the artist. And of course, if the artist is pretending that he's making a limited edition and then he's making 1,000 extras, then will be liable of, um, of deception. Uh, but technically speaking, the blockchain is not preventing this. Um, the, then there is like all the question, of course, of uh, uh, persistency. So how do we ensure that once I purchase my NFT, uh, the image is actually not codified into the blockchain. The image is either stored on a centralized server on the NFT platform, or it's stored on a decentralized network like IPFS. Um, and me as the purchaser of the NFT, I, I don't really have a guarantee that like if the platforms shut down, do I still have a way of proving what is the digital artwork that is associated with my NFT? Because the NFT is just a hash, just like the fingerprint of this digital artist. And so there needs to be like also concern and uh, of course, that means that whoever gets an NFT needs to also keep very safely a digital copy of uh, the digital artwork that is associated with this NFT. Um, and then there is the question of what are the rights associated uh, with the NFT? So um, in, some, in some sense, when I, when I purchase a particular uh, painting or a photograph, uh, I don't purchase the copyright into that uh, painting. I just purchase the physical copy of it. Uh, in the same way, when I purchase an NFT, I'm not actually purchasing the copyright license. Uh, I don't have any copyright rights over, uh, over the image that is associated to the NFT. Uh, I just own the copy, which is this digital token. Um, and of course, because it's a digital thing, I need to be able to display it. And so even the mere act of displaying uh, this image will potentially qualify as copyright infringement because I'm reproducing the digital artwork. Um, and so most NFT actually provide limited copyright licenses that are directly associated with that NFT, which enable uh, the owner of the NFT to display uh, the image on social medias, to display it on, on their own personal website or on virtual galleries and so forth. But that's a very limited type of, uh, of copyright licenses. And then the, perhaps the most interesting one is uh, uh, the question of, and it has happened recently with, uh, with uh, the digital artist people, um, in which it is actually possible uh, that anyone can actually go on the internet, take a particular digital image, which they are not the author of, and they can publish it uh, on an NFT platform and they can put it into auction and with their own wallet associated with it, right? And so all of a sudden, uh, so I am the artist, I create a digital artwork, someone else takes my digital artwork, put it on super rare as an NFT and sells it 
And then all the proceedings for those cells go to the other person. And of course, I'm the, I'm the author of the work. So I, I feel that I should have some kind of recourse against that. And the question then is, can I rely on copyright in order to, to have this recourse? Um, and what type of legal framework is available, is available to me in order to stop or to obtain damages from uh, any such person? And um, the interesting thing is that copyright actually is not really helpful here because the act of uh, creating an NFT does not entail any violation of any of the exclusive rights that are provided by copyright uh, because there is no reproduction because whatever is within the NFT is just the hash of the work and not the work itself. So the expression has not been reproduced. There is no distribution because all I'm distributing is the hash and basically all, all, the, all the patrimonial rights, the exclusive right of copyright are always associated with the expression, with the visualization, with the image of this digital artwork and not with the hash. And so when I actually create an NFT, I'm not violating copyright, even though I am allegedly creating an instance of a, a particular copy of a digital work. And so same thing, can we rely on for perhaps trademarks uh, because uh, there is some kind of like deception as to the origin of the work. And then of course, if, if someone is creating an NFT and claiming that they are the artist of that NFT, then there will be a violation. But if they are creating an NFT, I, I can take like the image of Picasso and I create an NFT out of this image. And I don't, I'm not claiming I am the author. I'm just saying this is an NFT of Picasso, which is actually true. Uh, in that case, trademark will not help us either. Um, and so the question then is becomes like, how do we how do we ensure that the, the that there is no kind of forgery, that there is no uh, that the authenticity of the NFT is actually uh, provided? And so copyright, with regard to the originality, trademark, with regard to the provenance, they cannot help us in that in that context. And so increasingly we have. Uh, non non legal non IP solution that are emerging, and so uh, for instance, Super Rare is now partnering with uh, Verisart, uh, where whoever and, and that creates a lot of exclusivity because all of sudden uh, the the platform are responsible for screening and uh, controlling and verifying that everyone that is actually putting a particular artwork on the platform are the legitimate author that uh, that the artist has not been already published on other, uh, on, on other platform and so forth. So all of a sudden we need to recreate those intermediaries that are necessary in order to verify the legitimacy and, um, and the authenticity of those, uh, of those digital work. Um, and, um, and basically, yeah, the question is then legally speaking, what type of uh, uh, legal basis can an artist use in case that someone else were to actually benefit from the sale of an NFT based on their work. And so IP is out of the question. And uh, of course, there has equity principles and potentially like the question of like unjust enrichment, uh, free riding and so forth, which are all things that come from more commercial uh, and civil thought as opposed to actual uh, intellectual property. So in some way, we can see how this, this, new create, this new creation, this new type of uh, uh, artistic practice, uh, copyright law is simply not ready for that. It's not designed for this. And it's also very difficult to even think about how could we reform copyright law in order to encompass NFT within its scope, because there is the danger that if we were to say, for instance, that the hash of a digital work were to be held as a derivative or as an equivalent to the actual expression, to the actual original file that is stemming from that hash, that will lead to a lot of problems because that means that, um, and no one can actually hash, use the hash of a, of a work, which is oftentimes used uh, in order to do proof of existence or in order to just reference a work, will actually be a copyright violation. And so that will be akin to saying that uh, a link towards a digital work, the, the URL towards a digital work will actually be a copyright infringement, which 
which has been proposed and which is very problematic as well. Um, so all this to say that we are today in like a very legally muddy uh, realm. And, uh, and while blockchain technology provides amazing opportunities for digital artists, uh, there is hey, a Primavera? lot- Primavera? Uh, yes. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. So yes. thank you very much for joining us today. And um, we, we hope that we will see your works in our exhibition, if that's possible. <laughs> okay. And thank Primavera, okay. uh, sorry to interrupt you and thank you so much for being with us.